building a thriving, financially sustainable business is like the holy grail for us creative people. So today I am interviewing Nicola Brown, and who is actually a very successful business person uh, working out of her creative practice. And she'll be telling us some of her secrets and some of her top tips. Hi, everyone. My name is Malu Colorin. I am the founder of Talu, a natural dye house and educational hub in beautiful West Wicklow in Ireland. And I'm really excited for today's interview with Nicola Brown. <laughs> I'm very excited today because I am here with Nicola Brown, who is an amazing eco printer specializing in the dirty pot, which I will ask her to explain to us in a second because it's a specific process. And she's also a wet filter. And this month, as many of you know, I'm focusing my content on how to create a and how to run a creative business practice. So one of the reasons why I'm really interested in talking to Nicola, not just because of her creative practice itself, is because she's really built a thriving business out of it. So um, we're going to pick her brains and ask her uh, how did she do it. So thanks for being here with me, Nicola. I'm really grateful that you agreed to join me today. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure. I've already mentioned the dirty floor, so can you tell us a little bit about your creative practice and how, how you got started with it and what is it exactly? Well, to start with, I never expected to end up working in the sustainable textile area. My background is I've always been an outdoors person. I always wanted to work with horses. So for almost 30 years, really, um, horses were my life. I've always enjoyed gardening. But I haven't fully appreciated, actually, that my grandmother's father was a linen merchant, a large linen work merchant in Scotland. And there must have been some attraction to textiles. I was always drawn to textiles. I was always drawn to the outdoors and gardening. And I'm interested in the environment. So in 2007, I was invited to um, jointly organize a not-for-profit festival it was to be a sustainable festival and that was where I actually got introduced to wet felting so because we were not for profit we were doing it on a very tight budget I was out putting posters up literally the week of the event locally and put one in a post office just down the road from me in rural Ireland and within half an hour I had a phone call from somebody called Carmen Sanchez Padron and at the time, I didn't realize how closely Carmen lived to me. She's only about seven miles away, but she was a Spanish lady living in Ireland, was working in community development, and she absolutely loved wet felting. So she offered her services for the festival and said she'd love to host felting workshops for children. And she would host the workshops free, but she would ask the parents to contribute for the materials. And I said, oh, we'd love to have you, Carmen. But there's one condition you have to, you know, offer the workshops to adults as well. And the reason I said that was I had been at an exhibition in Dublin at the RDS. I had seen an amazing large felt wall hanging. And through the whole day, I kept going back to that one spot in the exhibition hall. And I couldn't, I had no idea how felt was made. It's non-woven fabric using animal hair or wool. And I had no idea how it was made, but I knew if ever the opportunity became available, I would love to try it. So Carmen and I went back and forth a little bit and she said, OK. And that was the beginning of my love for textiles. And I participated in a short workshop with her during the festival. She told me afterwards she <laughs> she thought my piece would never come together. She thought I would just end up with <laughs> wet, soggy fabric. But the magic happened. And that started me on my journey, wet felting. So, so that was 2007, August 2007. And simultaneously, I had um, bought a new property. So I, I bought a house that hadn't been lived in for 78 years. It never had any electricity. It hadn't any water. And there was just a very tiny piece of land because farmers in Ireland don't like selling land. So I just had a really small bit of land, an acre around the house. And I was interested in developing the property using the most sustainable methods that I could. 
um, and I started felting and everything came together really quickly because I'm a little bit, um, somebody might say OCD, maybe. <laughs> so when I like something, I throw myself into it. So I threw myself into the felting. I started a blog. I focused on the felting. Initially, I was interested in also focusing on developing the house, but because in the blog, but because I was just flinging myself into the textiles, I got advice from somebody who was running a really good art education program. And I went to some trainings and all the theory was niche down. So from the very beginning, at the very beginning, everything that I wrote or I did was aimed towards wet felt makers. And within about a year and three quarters, I was traveling to America and I put a blog post up and I said I was going to be in San Francisco if anybody was interested in meeting up or having a workshop. And within two days, I had my first workshop booked. So that was how I got into felting. And the years progressed. I was teaching abroad, not making a living wage, but making, making good money for the teaching. But then I was paying it for flights and everything. And one of my international workshop participants, who's a really good friend now, is called Taria Kwong. She lives in Hong Kong. I've stayed with her on a couple of occasions in Hong Kong, and she's been here in Ireland, but we actually met in Portugal. So she came for a residential felting workshop in northern Portugal. And on the second last day, she asked me, would it be possible? Would I like her to do a demonstration about eco printing? And at that time, I wasn't exactly sure, um, you know, I, I knew eco printing was a process where you wrapped fabric with leaves or flowers or bark and you processed it over heat. But I honestly had never seen it, seen it in action. And I just thought, OK, why not? You know, she's offering. And so Taria did. She brought some things with her that she could use we found a pot on the farm where we were and she did a demonstration and she eco printed a piece of silk and it was beautiful so I was interested I did some experimenting because I stayed in Portugal for a further two weeks but I wasn't blown away by my results I came back to Ireland and again I tried in Ireland and I wasn't blown away but what I didn't appreciate was that for me the eco printing in the dirty pot process, as I use myself and as I share with other people, we're actually not using traditional powdered mordants or chemicals to prepare the fabric before we print. And I'm not saying to anybody that it's wrong to use the powdered chemicals because when you are naturally dyeing much vegetation, you have to use them to fix the color. And I do as well if I'm dyeing with comfrey for example that I grow here in my dye borders but for the eco printing I'm choosing to harness the power of the metal of the pot to influence the color and the light fastness of the prints and also what I put into it so I, if I wrap a piece on a copper pipe for example I get very different colors than if I wrap the piece on a cast iron pipe so that interested me but it wasn't until another past student in California said to me, I don't know what you're doing in Europe. You need to boil the bottom out of your saucepan. She said, try boiling your bundles for five hours and see what results you get. And bingo, that was it. So I work in an environmentally mindful way. I like foraging and harvesting for vegetation in the locality where I'm either living or where I'm teaching. And I prefer to work without traditional powdered mordants. They have their they have their place. I'm not anti mordants, but for my eco printing practice, I don't put plastic in the pot, and I work without powders. I love it. Um, but when you were talking about your house, it sounded like uh, you would have built it with felting. You were just so into the felting <laughs> that if you could, you would have just felted yourself a house. And, and I love the idea of that uh, and how kind of these two things came together at the same time. So it's amazing how things come together uh, kind of at the right time and, and what is also really interesting for me now like I never wake up in the morning and don't want to get out of bed 
because what I do, it's, it's a very rounded um, practice that I have. I'm growing the plants or I'm foraging. I'm out with my dog. I'm using my hands. It's a simple life. I'm, you know, yesterday I was making apple juice from the, you know, the trees that I've planted here. Um, you know, I have a small orchard. But what's very interesting, I actually was interviewed a couple of years ago by our main paper, the Irish Times, and I did a little bit of research into my mother's mother at that stage because they were very interested in the gardening background and it hadn't really occurred to me. I do come from a line of gardeners and my mother's mother actually owned and then ran a large nursery garden in Dublin because my mum's dad died when mum was six and he had just made an investment with my grandmother's first cousin and between them they were friends they had bought a large property in south county dublin and as a result when he died my grandmother got somebody else to invest in it and she ran that business for her whole life i'd say times were tough it, it, from the perspective that she was a woman running a business but it was a very well known nursery garden and they also as well as growing plants they grew flowers for the cut flower market and sold them in dublin so it never really occurred to me. I have, you know, that gardening and sustainability and maybe homemaking side comes from my mother. And then the textiles comes from my father's side of the family. So I do find that interesting. Yeah, yeah, it all it all influences. We, we don't think so much about it. Or sometimes we think like, oh, it's a very woo woo thing. But no, like your ancestors really are influencing um, your life and um, so it's really nice that you've harnessed all that into a beautiful creative practice and also that it has to do with the landscape that you're in I think that's um, that's amazing and it's just yeah I, well I, of course yeah. I, as a natural dyer myself that's also yeah. like oh you know yeah. working with the landscape is one of the best ways I think in which we can we can relate to what's out there I would love to know a bit more about Clashin so because you started with a house um, that was a tiny piece of land and now you have a huge yes. piece of land and it's there's <laughs> trees and there's it's you know I, I imagine it's not it's irrecognizable from the moment when you got it before so so when I look back at pictures I mean to me when I look at pictures of the house when I bought the house it was really really obvious what you know I could see as clearly as anything what it was going to look like there was never a moment's hesitation and I didn't see it as a big project a lot of outside people saw it as a very big project because, you know, it had no running water, it had no electricity, it had not been lived in for 78 years. But all I could see was how simply it could be brought back to life. And by keeping the, the spirit of the vernacular architecture, I do have a sink in the kitchen, which is in the main house, but I didn't change the structure of the main house at all, except to um, put a door downstairs and upstairs in the gable end to an extension and the extension is built to look like the old vernacular architecture of the region so the outside as well has lime plaster and there were some old sash windows with no glass in them I had a carpenter and he he um created the new windows based on the you know the design of the old ones so I have single glazed sash windows and something else in our region my house is south facing and there is only one window in the original house in the back of the house, which would be north facing. And again, people were saying, oh, you need to open it up and, you know, make more light in, in the house. And I said, no, the older people knew what they were doing. They have the windows this way for a reason. And so actually, it's a very comfortable house. And the reveals of the windows are at a 45 degree angle. And because I have whitewash on the inside, the light comes in the small windows and it's reflected uh, from the edges of the windows. So it's really interesting. I think, you know, modern house design, often people want to impress other people. In the past, people wanted to live with nature and they wanted to harness the best things and avoid the worst things. So that's that's sort of what I've done here. And as I say, Irish farmers don't like selling land. So I literally... I mean, the house was just sitting in a field. There was a, a there was a cattle crush where they would have put cattle through to count them or, or you know, inject them. 
right up against the house wall, but the house was sitting in in a field. So there had to be some fencing done um, because the farmer was was still farming. And he was an old man. He was in his late 80s when I first saw the property. So when the person came out to map the land for the sale, he said to Tom, if you don't give her some more land, she will not get planning permission to put more modern services in so you need to give her a little bit more so it was at that stage that I just got the one acre around the house that was all but they fenced that that was all part of the sale agreement so I had a secure fence on the property dry stone walls leading down and I had the house and it wasn't until several years after Tom died we became really great friends um, he never married but he had um, one he was one of six fascinating historian. They grew tobacco on the on the land during the war and um, really, really interesting. But he had one sister who married, but she had to move to England to work. So um, all her family were brought up in England. So she had four boys and two girls and they all came over one after the other to inspect me to see who was living beside Uncle Tom. <laughs> so we all became great friends. And when Tom died in, when he was 90, in his early 90s, uh, his, not, his 91st year, I inherited his sheepdog and they knew I was interested in more land. I always wanted some more land. There was a particular piece behind the house that I thought, well, you, you come down a lane to the property and I didn't want somebody building behind me because then they could look in on me. But a lot of local farmers had approached them before Tom died and said, you know, we'd like to buy the land. And they were, they found that very upsetting because they didn't want to sell and they knew their uncle was going to die and they, did, you know, they didn't want to sell the land. So I never mentioned anything. They did know I wanted that, that acre behind the house. But several years later, they made the decision to, to sell some of the land so that they could fund renovations on their property and so that each of the... Um, family could also have some cash from the sale so it was at that stage that um, I was away came home discovered the land was for sale including the field in front of my house and I was almost hysterical because it was going to auction and I thought I can't have somebody buying that I, I knew it was agricultural land but you know somebody could have got planning permission so to cut a long story short I contacted some other people and a friend um one of my neighboring farmers, younger guy who I was always friendly with him and his wife, he and I went in together and between us, we bought 26 and a half acres. So he got 10, I got 16 and a half. I already had an acre and they had reserved the acre that I want and not offered it for sale. So in fact, I project managed their development. We did a deal. So I didn't pay cash for that acre behind the house that's now planted with oak I actually project managed their um, renovations for them because they weren't in the country so we did a deal so that was really nice and then I had my dream come true so I planted 13 and a half thousand deciduous trees and then the rest of the land just has horses or you know at the moment we're waiting for a second cut of hay wow yeah, I mean, it sounds totally like a dream come true. And um, I'm, I'm grabbing like little hints uh, throughout your story. There's a lot of community, which I love. Um, it seems like through community, you've either made your felt uh, and further and afterwards eco printing practice come to life. And and that's also how you, you've you acquired um, and and managed this, uh, this amazing piece of land. So community seems like that's a big, big part of that. And I love it. What's very interesting in this part of Ireland, um, so I'm in County Carlow, but I'm very close to the County Wexford and County Kilkenny borders. I'm from County Wexford. That's where I was born and brought up. And over the years, Carlow is a very, it's almost a quiet county, to be honest, although there is a very good, um, you know, tourist board, let's say, in County Carlow tourism. They're excellent. It's not a very well-known county because I think the more the nearer you get to the center of Ireland, the less well-known the counties are. People tend to gravitate and tourists gravitate more to the coast. So even though I was born and brought up in the neighboring county, I had only really driven through County Carlow or 
every single year we always had this annual it was like a pilgrimage to Mount Leinster to the mountains we went hiking my parents prepared a picnic so Mount Leinster and the Blackstairs Mountains I was very familiar with but the rest of the county I wasn't so now I'm looking at you know the Blackstairs are to the front and the left of me Mount Leinster is behind I would have lived on the other side when I was in County Wexford but one and all people said that Carlo people were not friendly and they weren't welcoming to newcomers. That was what I had heard. And the exact opposite is true. Carlo people are very warm and they're very welcoming. But what they aren't is they aren't um, crowding you. So they don't try and become your best friend the first minute you arrive. They give you your space, but they are there for you if there is anything. So somebody could ring, for example, when I bought my pickup truck, uh, a neighbor rang and he said, I don't want to alarm you, Nicola, but there's a suspicious looking truck has just gone down your lane. And <laughs> he lives up the hill and he'd seen the white cab. And so there's a really neighborly spirit. And I was able to say, oh, thanks so much, John. It's my new truck. And he said, that's OK. I've only met him socially once in, in 20 years, but but that's the sort of spirit. People are really kind. And if you need something, they are immediately there to help. And for me, as now an artist, a textile artist, I like my privacy and space. I need, I don't need people popping in every five minutes. Yeah. And from a business perspective, lockdown was actually very good for me. Um, you know, from that perspective, because I could just focus and I could do a body of work and I was at home without without any outside distractions. Yeah, I, I completely understand. I'm the same. If I'm working, I just want to be focusing on the work uh, without anyone um, yes. <laughs> popping in for a cup as friendly <laughs> as, as that might be, you know, just let me focus yeah. and we'll have a couple later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have developed a strategy, which I'm not sure if you employ this strategy. But not, every, I mean, my, my good friends now all understand, you know, there's times when I'm working and times when I'm available. So if they say they'd like to come on a certain day, you know, am I free on a certain day? What I will say is, well, I'm working, but I'm going to take a break at 1230. If you'd like to come for lunch, I'll have to get back to work at half past one. And I give a start and an end point and everybody respects that. And I don't feel bad because I don't have to say, no, don't come. But equally, I can say at half past one, look, I'm sorry, I need to get back. I have a pot, you know, that's boiling or or whatever. So that's worked well for me and they respect that. Yeah, that sounds like really healthy boundaries. I actually, I should start um, applying that now because I'm the kind of person that loves the work. But also if I'm starting a conversation, I can go on and on and on for ages. So I that it also works to have those hard boundaries. Um, yeah, it, it's actually... Myself. It's actually interesting because it was somebody else who taught me that in a different business a long time ago. And they said, you need a start point and you need an end point because in Ireland, we're very open. And I mean, it's the same in other countries as well. And social events can go on and on and on. And they said, if you give an end point, people tend to come on time or, or more so, and then they go. And I had, I find that with English people in particular, uh, if I don't give an end point, I mean, I've been here in the past at 2 a.m. and I couldn't get people out and I was exhausted. And I had somebody else who came with the camper van and said they decided they'd stay the night. And, and I mean, I, I just wanted to go to bed. <laughs> so now I always give an end point, you know, unless it's New Year's Eve or something. But but with an end point, people have parameters. Yeah, yeah, that's that's an excellent tip. And folks, that's the first tip you're getting from Nicola, because that's right. the goal. <laughs> so write that down. Yeah. That's a good one for business and for life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I was also going to say some people might think that sounds a little bit rude, but actually, you know, it doesn't come across as being rude. If, you know, if you're working, your time is valuable. You wouldn't go to somebody in an office and expect them to give you a couple of hours if they were working in an office. So when you work for yourself, setting those boundaries, being flexible. When we work for ourselves, we can be flexible, being flexible, but having boundaries. And don't be afraid to say no, because that's really important. If you can't do something, you can't do it. There's nothing wrong with you that you can't do it. You have to prioritize your own mental health as well and just set the boundaries. 
yeah definitely we tend to think that as as self-employed people or as freelancers or as solopreneurs um whatever yeah. each person is doing um because we don't have quote-unquote business hours or, or office hours then you know oh, we're flexible and we can do whenever um and i i am really bad at that just so i'm gonna yeah. take on your advice um because it's really yeah it's really important you wouldn't bother somebody in their office at you know 3 p.m and like hey you, you know you want to go for a pint well no i'm working um so yeah thanks yeah. for that nicola <laughs> uh and i guess since we're already talking about business it sounds like for, almost from the start so almost since you started felting there was a business aspect to it because you started teaching very, very quickly on. But was that a conscious decision at the time? Or when did you consciously decide, like, this is going to be a business? Or, yeah, I guess, what's the story there? Well, I suppose I consciously, in, in a way, I, I did consciously decide I, I've always enjoyed teaching. And I would have liked to make my living and my income from what I was doing. And as I said to you before, I throw myself into things. So it was a very, very easy step to start teaching. What was not easy was to earn a sustainable living. That was not easy. And that's only happened laterally since, you know, a few things that happened during lockdown and also um, somebody called Jeff Walker, who you know as well. Um, <clears throat> since doing some studying with him, I had trained to teach people to ride many years ago. So I did a very intensive training in England to teach people to ride horses and teaching people to ride and producing show horses and um, breaking horses actually for the racing industry. That was what I worked at for many, many, many years. So once I started felting, I had had some issues with my back. I'd, I'd split up from somebody. I bought the property here. Once I started felting, it was a very easy decision to throw myself into it because if I'm passionate about something, I just go all out. And Within a couple of months of starting to felt, I was looking online a lot. And bear in mind that this was 2007. The internet was exceptionally slow. I didn't have a dial-up line. It, you know, it was really, really, really slow. But I discovered that there was a workshop happening in Germany with an international tutor, a very famous um, man called Mehmet Girgic. He's from Turkey. He's actually a UNESCO person of, I'm not sure if they call it person of interest, but it, it's a special term for a, somebody with huge cultural significance. And he had many, many, many generations of felt makers. So I actually flew to Germany and did a residential workshop with Mehmet. So that was just one year after I had started felting. And that really was mind blowing because in Ireland at the time, there were only 104 members of Felt Makers Ireland. And when we had get togethers and we looked at people's work, and this isn't a criticism, but this is an observation. Everybody would tell everybody their work was fantastic. So I didn't have any critical ability to critique my work. And when I went to this residential workshop, Carmen came with me. The two of us traveled together. So Carmen was my tutor at the beginning, and then we both went together. And I was just blown away by the garments people were wearing. One person had the most incredible wash bag and it was Nuno Felt and she must have lined it with, you know, waterproof fabric or something. But everybody, it was just a common occurrence. And I discovered that what I thought in Ireland was good was not good at all. <laughs> and that was a big, a big um, eye opener for me. So I came home and with renewed energy and vigor, and, you know, I was doing the blogging. And so it was a very short time later that I, you know, the blog really took off. I was organizing little craft swaps. I was using Flickr, but the internet wasn't, wasn't brilliant, but it, it, it was starting to become, you know, better and better. And then I put the post up saying I was going to America, if any, you know, I would be in San Francisco. The workshop happened and I got paid very well for the workshop I mean I, I never undersold myself at the beginning if that makes sense um because you have to value what you do I like to give a lot of information free but if you come to a workshop with me it's the implementation of the knowledge that you get so I, I did the workshop it was fantastic so I got a chunk of money on the last day I was in America or the second last day and came home and I thought wow now that I really really enjoyed that 
how about if I organized a trip where I did several workshops, would anybody be interested? So that first workshop was in March of 2009. So I had started felting in August 2007. And I came home and I put a blog post up and I said how much I'd enjoyed it, had the photographs and from the students' work. And I said, I'm thinking, you know, I'm planning on coming to America in the autumn for um, a teaching trip, you know, if you're interested in booking the workshop. And I think four venues booked workshops. And that was it. That was the beginning. But I was always robbing Peter to pay Paul. I never had enough income. And I didn't have, you know, I was working in the house. I didn't have the studio that I now have, the off-the-grid studio. Um, I, I just didn't. There aren't enough people in Ireland. Well, at the time, certainly there weren't enough people in Ireland um, <clears throat> to make a living teaching. And also, you're never a prophet in your own country. I mean, I have not once been invited by a, by a felting group in Ireland to facilitate a workshop, whereas I've taught so many times Canada, so many different um, states in America, multiple times Australia. Portugal, France, I've taught everywhere, but I've ne I've taught some local community groups in Ireland, but I've never been invited by a felting group. I have in Northern Ireland, I've taught there several times. So it's just interesting. And I knew I didn't want to do something else, but it was hard to make an income. And because I enjoy the internet, I decided to embrace online teaching. And this is pre-lockdown. Um, so I got some some very good mentoring and, and help from the Crafts Council of Ireland. I got some branding mentoring because I was also selling work, but not enough to make a living. And I got some excellent mentoring. And Eddie Shanahan was instrumental from the branding perspective. He's a, a marvelous man. Um, and the Crafts Council paid for me to do some mentoring with him. And as a result, I did several things. I start, you know, I registered for VAT. I went to showcase. I got selected for creative um, island in showcase on a couple of occasions, but I didn't enjoy retailing. I didn't enjoy that wholesaling. So I started converting my knowledge into an online workshop and I started offering online workshops and they went really well. Um, when lockdown came, I still wasn't making a living wage, but when lockdown came, I realized this is my opportunity to write a new workshop and to, to also offer something to people. So I wrote two workshops that were only $30 for the workshop. And then I had a workshop that was $200. It had been 220 and I reduced it to 200 just because of lockdown. And suddenly I had a steady stream of income. And for the first time I had income, it was really hard work because I had hundreds of people online and I had given them the, the I had given them the opportunity to ask me questions every day if they wanted. And some people would ask me 30 questions a day and I gave them access to me for six months. So you can only imagine with hundreds of people, you know, it, it was a lot of work, but I had an income. And unfortunately my mother's health health declined rapidly during um the latter part of our full lockdown she has alzheimer's and my father's cousin who lived by herself she got dementia and it suddenly went off the scale towards the end of lockdown so by the time lockdown ended i had some good online products made but i wasn't able even to to up you know to publicize them because i was using facebook and instagram and um, to publicize things and that was when it really struck me, I need to have a business model that works. And everything sort of came together very quickly. Once I realized this, I decided to start a YouTube channel. Um, I don't know why I didn't think about it before. I started getting new people in. I would have one short video a week answering one question or you know a little bit of a topic. And I became one of the pilot people who did a project with our local enterprise office. I had wonderful business mentoring from Mary Carty and anybody who is in Ireland, uh, look up Mary Carty. She's a wonderful female entrepreneur and she's really, really brilliant for mentoring. And I met somebody called Michal O'Neill. He introduced me to Jeff Walker and that was it. So I went from 
having no money in my bank account, literally, and using my credit card to pay for a program with Jeff Walker to five weeks later, releasing an ebook, which took in actually just over $12,000 in the first three days. So that was mind blowing. And since then, my business has just become sustainable. And it was just learning how to use the knowledge I had to help other people. In, in a lot of cases, the more you give, the more you get back. So I give plenty of information free, but if people want the nuance on my help, they then pay for either a membership or a course. But with Jeff, I learned how to offer these programs in a structured way that people would want them. So you, you actually try and share the transformation people can achieve as opposed to saying, well, you get X, Y, and Z. It's, you know, if you'd like crisp, clear eco prints or, you know, you want people to see what they can achieve because in fact, in many cases, people lack confidence. And so now I have a sustainable business. I employ several people part-time on contract work um, and I can't believe it. So that's a year and it'll be two years at the end of November and it's transformed my life. I've been following you for a while now. I can't remember when I first started following you, but it was definitely before. I mean, I didn't know about Jeff Walker at the time, yeah. but it was definitely before that. And I I mean, I remember, yeah, you had your YouTube channel, you had a, a social media following, and there was the blog. I, I But all of a sudden I was like, why is Nicole, like suddenly like she's exploded, like what is going on? <laughs> um, from, the, from the business perspective, you know, for anybody who's watching this, and they're interested in developing a creative business. It might sound counterintuitive, but you need to niche down as much as possible. So I was already from the eco printing perspective using, you know, what we call the dirty pot or pot as mordant method. And I have to say that if I hadn't um, devoured India Flint's book, Eco Color, that would not necessarily have been the way, you know, that I went down. But I've always been interested in the environment and I love I love going to salvage yards and antique yards and I'm always picking things up from the side of the road, bits of rusty metal. So my love of, of um, you know, scavenging and then recycling, buying clothing to upcycle them, the circular economy, it all came together. So I knew, you know, I'm quite defined with what I do from the textile perspective and what I actually teach. But I also, I mean, I do grow natural dye plants. I haven't had any time yet to, to dye this year, except with eucalyptus. But I'm not sharing that online. I'm just sharing one thing and staying focused. So you're better having less people, but they are interested in what you are offering. So being focused was a really, really, really good thing. And when I started the YouTube channel, that's when really I started reaching more other people. It was just like a light switch. The reason I investigated YouTube was I would always go to YouTube if I needed to learn how to uh, declog my, I had to, <laughs> I had to declog a Dyson one day. I didn't know how to dismantle the Dyson. Um, I have enough trouble getting the, getting it apart to, to get rid of the fluff. Um, went on YouTube, three minutes later, I had my Dyson dismantled and the blockage was cleared inside the machine, which is an unusual occurrence. And that was YouTube. It was a really poor video. The quality was appalling, but the content was good. And I would say to anybody, content is king. You do not need a fancy camera. You do not need, you know, sound is better. If you have a good mic, that's good. But you don't need to buy a lot of equipment. You just need to get started. And I joined a program with somebody called Sean Cannell and Think Media. And that was where I got all these really, really good um, tips about developing a YouTube business because it's the second largest search engine in the world. Google is first, YouTube is second, content is king. And he said at the beginning, keep your videos two to five minutes long and do one video a week and your channel will just grow and develop. And that's exactly what happened. And don't worry how bad you are, just hit record and put it out there. And just try and get better each week. And, and people never go back and look at all your old videos. So I've left them all there. And I, I didn't, you know, I learned how to do basic editing. But I enjoy live streaming the most because then I can just chat to people and 
talk. So that was another revelation. But don't worry about it. Don't stress. Just get on and do it. Yeah, definitely. I call myself a, a recovering perfectionist because I know I, I have it in me. And and as a, uh, I'm a graphic designer by before being a natural dyer, and you have to be, you know, very attention to detail and stuff which is you know it great it works great for the job but then you can just get caught up with you know the tiny little thing and you're not looking at the big picture so yeah just it, that's it you know just go out and do it and get it done and you'll get better with time <laughs> the more you do something the more you you improve where i get hung up on certain things um i would get hung up on text so if i'm writing text to a company videos you know, as a tutorial, I I want that to be absolutely perfect. And Mihal says to me often, you know, nobody else knows what you want to write. Just get it out there. You can always edit it or change it afterwards. You know, do your best, but set yourself maybe a time limit. So that's something now, if I'm finding I'm struggling, uh, you know, that's what I will do. I will just say, OK, I'm going to give this one more hour and then I'm just going to publish whatever it is. And, you know, I can go back. And I did ask some of my membership people early on when I was working with them and I was developing the membership, you know, should I re-record some of the early videos? Because I had imported them into the library from previous workshop content. So try and, and use things you already have if you're launching something and um don't make it complicated you know with, with jeff's system and um, you know the product launch formula system that i absolutely it's my bible you know there's a system which he shares don't change it i did everything he said and it you know he has something called a sideways sales letter and it's just you know the first le letter shows the possibilities and you know then ownership uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. And you're sending a series of emails and I thought, oh, no, I do not want to send people, you know, all these emails. And then I thought, well, hold on a second. This man is successful. It's worked for many, many, many thousands of other people. Why would I not follow his process? So when I actually launched my book, I thought I'm going to really frustrate people. They're going to be unhappy that they get all these emails. In fact, they weren't. And as a result, um, that's why, you know, initially my book sold so well and it's continued to sell and other products that I've launched, launched using this system, they all work. Um, so the system works. So don't try and reinvent things. And if you ask somebody a question, often people ask me questions and I know the answer they want me to tell them. But that's not the correct answer. And they keep asking the same question, wanting me to answer how they want. And you, you don't get things if you don't work and you don't learn so you have to sometimes do things you're uncomfortable with I'm, I'm grabbing all these little like snippets it just sounds like I mean I mentioned community already you know the importance of community taking risks you mentioned that earlier like you weren't sure of it teaching something and then you just went ahead and did it like you know taking risks is a big one I think in business and sometimes we're very again it's the perfectionism we're so scared of getting it wrong that we don't take a risk yeah and I also think if you haven't you know it because creative people were our worst critics. And when it, com when it comes to teaching, all you need to think about is, well, this person has never done X, Y, or Z. Let's say it's crochet. I'm crocheting all the time. I mean, I can show them how to start, do their chain, do, you know, make a square, edge the square. So long as you know more than the person you are talking to, all is good. And then there are people in my membership club that, that are probably much better felt makers than I am. And at one stage I referenced this during a live stream and one of them said to me, not at all, that everybody learns different things from different tutors. So there are nuances that are different. And with the eco printing, my, my membership club is all about felting and eco printing. But if you're intending to eco print your felt, there are differences to the fiber that you use for your felting, you know, the colors, what you select. So there are nuances that even if somebody is very experienced as a felter, they won't know those nuances if they want to eco print their felt. So just yeah. remember, you know more or you know different things than the person you are talking to or sharing with in whatever way. And also, I really really hate using zoom 
but I find that my people love using Zoom. I prefer using software called StreamYard when I'm hosting a live stream because I can't see everybody who's attending. But the people who are attending love seeing each other. And I find Zoom difficult. I can't queue things up the way I want them. But in my club, we have Zoom calls. I never look at them again because I don't like seeing the faces that I'm making or what I look like or what I sound like. But you have to get over yourself because if you're offering value to people, they don't care what you sound like. All they want is the information. And going all in, you you said, you know, once you go into something, you just go for it. And I think... That's really important. Um, sometimes as creative people, and that, this happens to me as well, you know, you want to do a bit of everything and you want to try everything, which is part of, I don't know. Yeah, I guess it's part of being creative, but also focusing on something really, yeah. really pays off. I think the fact that I now have to drive up and down to Dublin, you know, it's a round trip of approximately four hours. I have to go up and down to Dublin every week to help care for my mother and Sylvia. And um, at the beginning, before they both had full-time carers living in with them in their respective houses, they're not in the same house. At that stage, I was spending three or four days a week in Dublin. And that was really, really, really difficult. And if I hadn't had the security of, you know, the income that was coming in um, from my book sales and from my online work, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, I don't get the same amount of time in the studio as I would like now, but you have to prioritize things. And because I didn't have the time, even my online work, if it's not perfect, I just release it now. You know, if I had had more time, I might have second guessed things more, but I didn't have the time. I just had to do it. It's something that can be a, a disadvantage, but it's actually a blessing, you know, like I don't have time, so just do it. Um, yes, just... and I, I see so many creative people and I might have gone down that rabbit hole myself before, but, you know, you want the perfect website. You, you do all this research. You want everything to look visually beautiful. You don't want to release anything unless you have perfect thumbnails, you, you know, and Canva, when you're creating um, graphics to share online, Canva is a wonderful, um, wonderful resource. But as a creative person, it can also be a rabbit hole. You go and then you start going down and you look at these templates. And before you know it, three hours has passed and you haven't got your thing done and you're more confused and then you just leave it. So for me, just trying to say, OK, I can feel myself go down that rabbit hole. I'm going to give myself 20 minutes and it, you know, I can research for 20 minutes. But at the end of that time, I'm going to pick one template or do my own. And that's it. Having limited time has made a difference. And I'm after we finish chatting, I'm heading up to Dublin and I'm actually going to be up there for several days now with mom and Sylvia. So we will be doing things together. And I know I won't regret spending this time with them. I am sad that I don't have more hands on time, but I'm really thrilled that that having developed the business, I don't have to have hands on time every week now. I can get it when, when I can, but at least I can share what I'm doing with other people. And, and the community aspect is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, no, that sounds brilliant. Like a great um, life life work balance mm -hmm. um and yes i'm i'm aware that uh, that you need to get going soon so i guess just one last thing of uh, how what or you've kind of already mentioned but maybe that maybe there's something else you'd like to add what does success like look like to you because i know success looks very different for for everyone so what is it for you well it's it's actually difficult to explain how much my life has changed since i you know started working with Mihol through our local enterprise office and since I discovered Jeff Walker's product launch formula and that was through Mihol because he's one of Jeff's you know alumni and the difference it has made not having to worry about bills it's really really difficult it's not about it's being successful is not all about money but when you are an artisan maker and you have not got money and you have bills to pay and you do not know how you're going to pay your bills that's really 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 tough and I was on the road to Dublin as I say for days every week I was finding it really hard I hadn't got the you know the the money to put petrol in the car always sometimes you know and my mother you know would pay for lunch and stuff when we were out so going from 
really, really on a weekly basis, not knowing where the next money was, you know, was coming in so that I had the time to go up and down to Dublin and help care for mom and Sylvia to being in a position that I can help other people achieve their goals. I can do that through, you know, adding value for other people, helping them do it, whether they pay and get a lot more personal attention from me or whether they at the beginning do something that's not paid to being able to just if I want a new pair of, you know, hiking boots, for example, I can just buy them. I do, it's not that I don't worry about the price, but I have the freedom to do that. For me, success ultimately means being able to do what I love, earn a sustainable income and be free to be flexible to, um, you know, to help care for mom at the moment. Um, but it is hard work. It's not not you know people just think it comes easily there have been years before and it's harnessing your knowledge from before and finding something that's really suitable for you and success for me ultimately will mean I don't have to do you know I'll have some products you know membership and some courses they're already written and I will ultimately be able to offer them again but have more free time a for the studio but b for hiking um you know doing things that I enjoy with friends. So it's having that sort of launch life, the freedom to do what you want to do, but know that you have a recurring income. So your income is secure, so you can do the things and you're helping other people. That's it, really. Definitely. That's that's a dream. That sounds like uh, many people will agree with. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly it. Um, well, thanks so much, uh, Nicola. I'm really, really grateful that you took the time to do this, especially because, yeah, I know you, you're heading to Dublin. Is there anything else you would like to share with um, with folks? Or, I mean, uh, this has been I suppose there's full one... of information and nuggets of uh, little pearls of wisdom everywhere. Um, so thank you so much. But then, <laughs> so yeah, well, go on. Thank you for inviting me. There is actually one tip that I got from an American lady Um I'm not going to talk anything about what I was involved in before, but at one stage I was earning extra income years and years ago from a network marketing business, not a pyramid scheme, from a network marketing catalog based business. And there was an American mentor of mine who came over to Ireland on multiple occasions and she facilitated incredible, um, you know, face to face seminars. And at one of them, she was she was a multi, multi, multi millionaire. And having started from zero and she was very down to earth, very hardworking. And one of her, her presentations, she gave this tip and she just said, you know, the really, really, really big secret to success, you know, you, you get up in the morning, you, um, you know, you have your breakfast, you know, you get dressed, you make your bed or whatever, you get up at a certain time in the morning and then and she said, you have your breakfast, you go upstairs and you do your teeth. And she said, this is my absolute top tip. And we were all hanging on our seats. And she said, you exit your house. <laughs> and I can remember, like people just were, whoa, you know. So when you work from home, you may not physically be exiting your house. You may, in my case, be going out into the fields or the garden or the, you know, the dye borders or the studio. But it's that mental shift. So you've got up, you've prepared yourself and you're exiting to do your work. And she said, that is the biggest thing. And not to get caught up in sitting on your computer and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I work a lot on the computer because I'm teaching online. But another tip I got from one other person, totally different. It was a business um, tip was she never, ever opens her emails or switches her computer on until two o'clock. Because as soon as you go down that rabbit hole and you look at your emails, that's it. You start answering them and suddenly you don't do what you, you want to do. So the, I would say that if you can get up in the morning, you know, have your breakfast and then you can mentally exit to go and do whatever you're planning to do for the day. Do that. And that that really has helped me. So I often think of her all, all these years later. <laughs> That's that's a great one. And I guess, yeah, it links with what you said before of having these like boundaries. I'm exiting yeah. the house and I'm going to work, even if it's yeah. just changing to my <laughs> to the 
uh, to the table where I do my work or whatever, exactly. you know, <laughs> even exactly. if it's not the house. Um, yeah. And the importance of having mentors, of just asking for help and, and learning from as many people as possible, because you've done it both in your creative practice, uh, but also in your business life. So, yeah, the importance of not doing it alone and not yeah. trying to Absolutely. figure it all out on your own. And I think it, it comes back to what I said. People often ask me questions, you know, particularly about leaves when it comes to eco printing. You know, I say they will get no color from a specific leaf, but they want to try it. And so they ask me, well, are you sure I won't get? And I say, I am. And they say, but it's such a beautiful leaf. I'd really like to use it. And I say, you won't get color. And then they say it again. And then I'll say, OK, you know, you're asking me. The answer is the same every time. This is not going to work but we're adults, you can go and try that, but it won't work, you know? And so if you have a mentor, they will tell you things that you don't necessarily want to hear. But if you apply them, they will work because they have the experience and we have to learn from them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's a question I, I get a lot as well for natural dyeing. Will this give me color? Will this give me color? Yeah. Like probably many things will give you a pale yellow but like are, yeah. are you going to go through the trouble of doing everything for a pale yellow just use the stuff that <laughs> that works <laughs> thank you so much Nicola this was brilliant and I'm sure uh, people will find it very very valuable there were a lot of golden nuggets uh, sprinkled throughout so thank you so much well thank you so much for um, inviting me to chat with you I hope you enjoyed the interview today. I certainly did. It was really, really eye-opening. And most importantly, I hope we will all start implementing Nicola's tips because they've gotten her to where she is. So, um, you know, they can work for us too. And if you want to learn more about Nicola Brown and if you want to check out her online workshops, her membership, um, check out what she's doing, read her blog, everything, she uh, her YouTube channel as well. It's all on her website, nicolabrown.ie. And on Instagram, she's at nicolabrownplashin altogether. Um, but on her website, you'll be able to find everything, nicolabrown.ie. So um, thank you again, Nicola, for, for showing up for this. And I'll see you all next time. Mm -hmm.